Welcome everybody to the Open Education Network session on putting the code of best practice for fair use in OER into action, case studies in the OEN. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm publishing director. I'm joined by Barb Thies, our community manager, and I believe by Dave Ernst, our executive director as well. Thank all of you for joining us. We know you likely have many demands on your time and many Zoom dates in your calendar. We're thankful for your engagement today as we explore questions around fair use and specifically the new code. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes getting us oriented. At the same time, if you haven't already, I invite you to say hello, introduce yourselves to other OEN community members in the chat if you like. I think uh, these introductions are always fun and just a nice reminder that we're all here together uh, online in this room and uh, we'll be working together on uh, exploring these issues. I will introduce our colleagues shortly as I talk through the agenda, which we really envision largely as an open discussion with you. Our goal is to explore your concerns and perhaps some case studies, things that you've been wrestling with or things you may anticipate when it comes to fair use. Our goal is to understand how you feel about using the code in supporting open educational practices. This conversation may inform how we revisit, for example, open textbook library collection policy or publishing best practices. And we have set aside 90 minutes for this session and invite you to stay for as long as you're able. Of course, we may uh, be really efficient and uh, wrap up this conversation in half that time, but just so you know, um, that, that is what we've set aside. So today is also the second of three sessions we've planned around the newly released code of best practice for fair use. The first section, excuse me, the first session was an introduction to the code and uh, what it is and what it is not and how it came to be. Today's session is meant to be a follow-up, more of an informal panel focused on ways that uh, your colleagues and perhaps you have worked um, with the code in the OEN as a way to explore what the code may mean in our daily professional practice. And then in our third session, which is scheduled for May 12th, we can continue this conversation around what implementing the code in your work may look like. Today's plan is to start with Will Cross from North Carolina State University and Meredith Jacob from American University. The two of them will briefly describe the code, then turn things over to Carla Myers at Miami University in Ohio, where we learned there was snow, and Josh Bolick at University of Kansas, where there was also snow yesterday. They will talk about how they use the code and suggest ways others in the OEN may find the code useful. After that is when we're going to start exploring questions together. We will really be turning to you for your questions and ideas. This is set up as a meeting, not a webinar, as you can see. So please feel free to post those questions in the chat, or if it would be tedious to type out everything in the chat, we would be happy to hear from you. So um, just let us know and, and uh, we can unmute you or you can unmute. So that is the plan for today. Thank you again for joining us. I'm now turning things over to Will and Meredith. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'll, I'll start us off and Meredith, please feel free to jump in anytime. I think it's pretty likely scanning the names that I see on the call here that, that you, most of you have a sense of what the code is already and it wouldn't be a terribly good use of your time to spend the next half hour sort of going through in, in painstaking excruciating detail. Um, there's also a link to the code in the chat, so if you want to review some of the finer points or, or pull out language, that's there. But we wanted to, to sort of briefly reiterate a couple of things that we think are significant about the code. Um, the first is that it's sort of community-driven, lawyer-approved, borrowing the old kid-tested, mother-approved commercial jingle. If you're of a certain age, as I am, you might remember, um, in, in that what it does is it brings together um, all these conversations that have been had across the open education community about these are the sort of things we think would be useful to do. These are the sort of things that feel like a good, responsible, thoughtful practitioner would do as well. Um, most of the language in the code comes from those conversations, particularly the four principles that we'll mention a moment ago. Um, but it's also been vetted by a set of, of sort of well-respected, knowledgeable um, legal experts who are not part of the team and thus uh, had the freedom to come in and say, like, look more closely at that or reconsider that. And it's certainly the case that each of those people offered uh, thoughtful comments and suggestions that help us continue to refine 
the way we talked about what appeared in the code. So community driven lawyer approved, that's thing number one. The second, the second thing to say is um, that the code, as all of these codes do, it sort of describes an approach to reasoning about these questions. It's not a set of uh, rules of thumb or bright line rules or, or shortcuts or anything like that. This isn't, as, as Meredith has said before, a law degree in a box. This is a, a, a structure for sort of thinking through these questions. I think we believe pretty strongly that makes it much more better and much more durable and much more sort of meaningful in this context. Um, but it, it is there not to, to finish the discussion, but to facilitate a good discussion in the context of creating and revising open educational resources. Um, it also includes, as I mentioned, those set of four principles with a set of considerations and hard cases um, attached to each. And if we wanted to dig into any of those principles, um, I think the panel would be happy to do that. But those, as I say, reflect uh, the sort of the centers of gravity that appeared in those conversations we had around what were the most common questions, the most sort of typical and pedagogically significant things that folks wanted to do from a teaching perspective. Um, it also includes that set of appendices that talk through some adjacent areas of law, and in particular, the sort of downstream across national borders question that came up a fair amount. What does it mean if we want this resource to exist in the US and in Canada or in the US and Canada and you know, the rest of the world as well. Um, and we benefited tremendously from good conversations, particularly, but not exclusively with Dr. Karis Craig uh, in Canada, who, who shared her expertise in a deep way about the general compatibility of the different exceptions, that sometimes there's different language used uh, in the way the exceptions are worded, but they sort of, you know, it's many paths up the mountain. It's a lot of ways to get to the same sense of copyright as a system is supposed to support non-commercial, particularly transformative education, and the different exceptions embody different ways of doing that. Um, and then the last thing I'll say there is that the code also includes, I think, a, a pretty significant discussion about marking instances of fair use. The other big question we heard was, we don't want any downstream users to be taken by surprise that there are materials included under fair use. And so we, we sort of sketched out what we heard in those conversations and offered a few different approaches for making clear this OER is CC by except for where we have made it clear that we're relying on fair use or the public domain or, or something else as well. And I think those three things, the sort of community driven, the sort of approach to rather than easy answer and, and the structure and coverage are the things I wanted to make sure we reiterated to have those sort of at top of mind. Meredith, is there anything else you'd like to add to make sure? No, I think that's a great introduction. Um, I would just say, I think, to sort of reinforce what Will has introduced that um, as we go forward, we're really hoping that the people in this community can sort of be our partners in exploring and making concrete um, the sort of more general ideas and the best practices and in figuring out how they can be a help to you in your work. Thanks, Meredith. So, so the next step, as Karen indicated, is there's this thing out in the world. What do we do with it? Um, and to the extent that the thing is, is well understood or well enough understood with the opportunity to keep asking questions, uh, I think our, our hope for this session was the what do we do with it uh, work start uh, being done. And so we've invited two, two great folks from across the OEN to talk some about what they are or think they might like to be doing with the code. Um, if you don't know Josh or Carla, you should because they're, they're really nice people and really smart people and doing really cool stuff. Um, I'm happy to do the smartest thing I'm going to do all day, which is to shut up and let them talk for a little while now. So, um, Josh, I think you claimed vaccination privilege and, and suggested that you get to go first. So why don't we let you go so that if you collapse midway through, we can get the benefit of as much of what you have to say as possible. Sure. Thanks, Will. I'm going to remind you of the like smart thing to do is to stop talking and let me speak on our, our calls in the future. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, uh, as Will indicated, and I mentioned in the chat, uh, I got my second Moderna vaccine about 24 hours ago and feel pretty meh uh, from it. Um, so you're getting me in my pajamas. Um, but um, what I, you know, I've been supportive of what Will and Meredith and Peter and uh, Prue have been doing to develop this for uh, uh, as long as I've been aware of it. And um, because I, you know, there there are two things that make me excited about the the best practices uh, for fair use in OER, and one of them is it for internal creation projects that I'm supporting 
through our grant program or just consulting on at the University of Kansas, that it provides a, you know, a framework for th third party use. Like previously, um, we did an, uh, an OER of music video analysis. And you just can't do that kind of resource without leaning on fair use. And in that, we uh, used the College Art Association's best practices for fair use in the visual arts, and it was related enough to make it work. But this document um, is more in scope, and especially, you know, for languages and um, contemporary culture. Um, but more, more generally, just for the the arguments that I think Will and uh, Meredith have made elsewhere, that we shouldn't be harming the efficacy or quality of work or undermining its accessibility out of um, too much fear for third party use and uh, of third party use. And that gets to the other thing that excites me about this, which is that I think that authors increasingly are aware of the OEN and are aware of the Open Textbook Library and are connected to these communities or connected to someone who is connected to them. And they see the OTL and the, the indexing of their work in the OTL as an important discovery mechanism. And previously there have been these questions about like, oh, well, where, where tell us about these images. And that's, you know, that's understandable, but I'm hoping that this document can provide a framework for the OTL to sort of consider which you're doing right here right like we're having this conversation so this is great but to think about the role of third-party use and, and inserts and fair use in the oer that is indexed in the library um you know we already live with textual quotes in lots of works and screen caps in uh probably at least some open textbooks that are in the otl but also like the the OEN slides include lots of screen caps, and that's a great example of fair use in an openly licensed object that's never been controversial, to my knowledge at all. Um, and so, like, you know, the, an argument I would make is that we already live with fair use in openly licensed objects, and this just provides a sort of community agreed upon framework to do that more. Those, those are the points I wanted to make. Thank you. Fabulous points, Josh, and I agree with all of them. Um, so I was so excited when I heard that this was in formation. Um, when it came out, it just exceeded my expectations. It's just such a wonderful, strong, thoughtful, and well-crafted document from, I think, both um, a user standpoint and a legal standpoint. And I think one of the benefits that I'm already seeing and realizing is confidence building. And I had to think about the best way to say this, um, but it's with kind of different groups. Um, so I think first off, in general, everybody creating OER, that yes, fair use is an option. And it's another option. You know, of course, we have public domain works that we can incorporate and creative commons works that we can incorporate. But fair use is this document Fair use is this option too. And I think this document really can, as a community, give us confidence that yes, this is something we can think about and we can utilize. So on campus, um, it's funny because I've been working here for almost five years, which seems kind of strange to think it's gone by fast and slow, slow mostly because of COVID. But um, I feel like I've gotten lots of people I work with to this point where they're more comfortable being like, yes, let's think about these user rights like fair use when we're offering services or resources. Except with OER, people will be like, oh, fair use for OER. Is that the best way to go? Should we should we maybe just use Creative Commons instead? Because that's that's a little bit easier. And so it was kind of this always interesting juxtaposition to see faculty getting more confident in the idea of using fair use in, you know, maybe a scholarly article or a book chapter or as part of instruction. But then when we're talking about OER, seeing them be a little bit hesitant or even when talking with administrators on my campus, including our campus legal counsel, when talking about um, our OER publishing program. And so I think one of the great things this document can do is give that confidence to administrators that this is what other institutions are doing. Um, one thing I've learned throughout my career is that administrators seem to love to know somebody else is doing this, right? And who's doing it? Like somebody else is working on this. 
okay, if other people are doing that, that gives us a little bit more confidence. So I think one of the great things is to take this to the powers that be on my campus who weren't flat out like, no, we're not going to use fair use, but again, a little bit more hesitant because there were these other options to be like, this is what other institutions are doing. And we are seeing more institutions, not just here in the United States, like they said, but also in other countries recognize that in the law, there are these user rights that we can use to make sure that these publishing programs that we're supporting are putting out the best materials possible. I think another group is um, our faculty authors. And some of them were a little bit hesitant about fair use because, you know, Creative Commons they viewed as a little bit easier. I think where some of the barriers were too is just in making those fair use determinations. And that is not uncommon. Um, all of our lives would be so much easier if we could just be like, yes, that's fair use, it's educational, or yes, that's fair use, it's an OER, because of course we know we can't do that. We have to think through those four factors. And, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I've been working with copyright for over 15 years now. And there are still times that I hesitate with fair use determinations. So how is this for our faculty authors who are approaching fair use from this new lens that these are going to be more broadly shared? So one of the things I like about the code is that this is a document that I can share with them. It is written in plain language. It's not like an overwhelming legalese document that they worry, you know, how am I going to work through this? But in plain language, here are things that we should be thinking about when we want to consider fair use in OER. And it's just more information to help them very thoughtfully think through those four factors of fair use as they're thinking about incorporating third party works into an OER. And just kind of really help them to think, okay, this is a situation where this is a critical work we want to include in the OER for pedagogical purposes. We're going to make this thoughtful fair use determination. And yeah, based on the information we read here and applying this to the four factors, we think that's fair. Or, Carla, I thought through the four factors, I thought about everything in this document, and I'm still a little uncertain this might not be fair use. Okay, then let's take a look at those other options like public domain or creative commons because you are feeling a little iffy about it. So I think this is really a confidence booster for our authors in creating OER as well. And um, I've already alluded this to a little, alluded to this a little bit. It's a confidence booster for me too. Um, you know, I it's it's again, I've been doing this for over 15 years, and there are no easy answers, even for those of us who have been doing it for a long time. And Josh and Meredith and Will, I invite you to jump in on this too. It's, I don't think a month goes by where I don't reach out to one of my copyright librarian colleagues and say, can you help me think through this scenario? It's just a really tough one. I wanna share this with you and my thoughts and, and kind of like what was said earlier, you know, give me some feedback. Am I missing something? Is there other, some other insight? So to start with, this document is kind of like having everybody who put input into it being there and having that conversation with me. I think through that fair use scenario, I take into account all this insight that went into the document from tons of colleagues across the profession. And it's a little bit like having that conversation with all of those folks. It's just great thinking points when I'm on the fence about something myself. And then of course, um, you know, it's one thing to share out here is reach out to folks if you find yourself in one of those sticky situations. It's reach out to me. I'm happy to talk you through a scenario. One of the things I love about being a copyright librarian is everybody is a nice, fantastic, wonderful person. Um, and just really recognizing that, you know, we're in this together and having those conversations. So listen to those voices that shared knowledge, everything that was poured into this document. But, um, you know, reach out to the OEN community, reach out to the copyright community if you need some help building on top of that. And I hope this document gives you some of that confidence, not just to make your own thoughtful more fair use determinations, but to know that there's tons of people out there who are eager to have the conversations that's so evidenced by all the people who contributed to the document and reach out to be part of that.
Okay, thank you, Will, Meredith, Josh, and Carla for getting us started. Really appreciate your opening remarks and kind of orienting us to uh, what we want to explore today. So this is the time uh, for all of you who are joining us to please uh, drop something in the chat as you are listening. If, if yes, buts came into your head or um, uh, particular scenarios that you've wrestled with and, and still feel perhaps uncomfortable with, or maybe you've recently leaned on the code or, or had a, a win where you thought, okay, this is really doable and this is helpful. Um, this is your time. I will get us started as you're uh, thinking of your questions and first want to acknowledge and appreciate what Carla sort of closed on, which was the question of community or rather the existence of community and how it will continue to be here um, as, as we all um, learn more about fair use. So one of the things that uh, you, Carlin, and Josh as well spoke to was some faculty fear and trepidation about uh, navigating fair use. And um, you know, some people in this call uh, may not have uh, copyright expertise uh, that others do have. Um, do you think that uh, this, this sort of shift really in, in the open education landscape where we might be moving away from everything has to be openly licensed. For example, that is the first criteria uh, in the open textbook library collection criteria that I put in the chat. Um, and as Josh alluded to, certainly there are um, books in the library that make great use of fair use. We do not do a line by line or chapter by chapter review. But in thinking about perhaps that first criteria in the open textbook library shifting to become more inclusive to say, you know, everything uh, in your open textbook should be openly licensed or used, uh, you know, with fair use in mind, I need to work on the, the wording of that a little bit. Um, you know, how do any of you feel about that? Does it make you go, hmm, about the library? Does it make you feel like that's a pretty significant shift or does it feel this is pretty, this is natural. This is what we have been doing and this fits in. I would really like to sort of take the temperature of, of people who are here and, and hear your thoughts on that question uh, using the OTL as, as sort of an example scenario there. Just to check, is that question for Josh and I within the context of what we talked about or is that question for the whole group? The question is for the whole group, although I'm happy to hear from anyone, but we know how you feel. <laughs> You're wearing your hearts on your sleeves. And, and to be clear, like I can appreciate the complexity of like figuring out like, okay, we have this framework, but how, you know, like, how do you build that into your criteria? You know, I mean, it's, like I maybe presented it in a like, oh, we already live with this and it hasn't been a problem um, in a simplistic way, but like I recognize that there's more complexity to that, especially as OTL is figuring out or the OEN is figuring out how to do it in a manner that the community and users feel comfortable with. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's that last part which um, really inspires the question. And I will just say there is absolutely nothing wrong with using all open, openly licensed or public domain works in an OER. Um, it does provide some simplicity for downstream users that, you know, well, this is a public domain. We don't have to worry about it. Or if our reuse falls within the scope of this open license, we don't have to think through other things. Um, that said, I have worked with folks who really wanted to use a third party work that was not public domain or open license. Um, and their, their, their concerns about making a fair use determination. I, I worry that they ended up using an open licensed work when the fair use one would have been better from a sound pedagogical standpoint. It just would have been better for what they were trying to communicate. 
Um, and, and that's, I think, the balance we need to strike because that's the balance that's actually called for when we look at the origins of US copyright law, which says to promote the progress in the science and useful arts. And that's what OER is doing. Um, so I think we need to find that middle ground. But the tricky thing is, I can't make the fair use determination for the faculty member because fair use determinations have to be made by the person who is actually making the use. So our authors, whether they are faculty or students. Now, as a coordinator of our publishing program, I kind of sign off on those because if they're doing something that's going to get us sued, it's, it's like something so extreme. Um, you know, it's, it's, I have to have that on my radar. So I'm thinking through fair use on my own for everything they include, just like as a journal editor, when our authors are reusing things under the auspices of fair use, I'm thinking through their fair use determinations as well. Um, so I think it is if faculty are interested in using fair use, and they are not absolutely required to, but how do we make them more confident in making that thoughtful determination? And I think this code is a fabulous tool to do that. Thanks, Carla. Uh, one comment that I might add to that is, I think that in some ways, well, two things, I guess. One is when faculty are feeling unsure about how to interpret the code, um, and I think that's true for their uncertainty, but also for you as a, a copyright expert or a librarian, sort of taking a step back and really focusing on what the pedagogical purpose of the inserted material is, is really helpful because that's what they're an expert in, right? And so saying to you them like, okay, so why do you wanna use this image? Is it just decorative? Why is this image better than that image? Why is this excerpt important? If you wanna use this excerpt from a film, why did you pick this start time and this end time? Is there a good reason for that? And I think that's an area where faculty members have a lot of confidence, right? Like if you say, why is this a good example of, you know, 19, you know, mid 20th century transition from this style of poetry to that style of poetry? Did you just pick it at random? The answer is always going to be no. I have a very concrete reason about why this is the right example. It's something where people feel passionate and they feel confident. And so starting at that pedagogical moment, and if you can say clearly, this is why this is the thing that I wanna use. It's the best illustration of this. It really shows this well. And this is the reason I'm teaching. I'm trying to teach this thing. That's an area where faculty typically have really high confidence. Like they know their subject and they know why they wanna use what they wanna use. And that confidence is sort of the zero with question to be like, okay, so what was this originally used for? Like, well, it was, you know, artistic or it was news or it was a handbill or whatever. Okay, and you're using it for what pedagogical purpose now? Is that different? That question is the sort of core question in fair use. And the big piece of information that you need is a piece of information about which your faculty are expert, which is why'd you pick this and what are you doing with it? It's not really a legal question. And so you're not asking them to be certain about legal questions. You're asking them to be certain about subject matter area expertise, which is something that they should feel comfortable doing. Or in the rare case where they're like, I don't know, I like to let this B-roll run while I start talking to students that think it sets the scene. Well, then you're like, okay, either come up with a more concrete explanation of why you like this, or maybe it's not fair use. Um, the other thing I will say is in some of our early conversations in the last uh, three months about understanding the code, I think people, this analogy might not be quite right. So it's the first time I'm trying it out. So I'll bear with you. <laughs> but I think that sometimes the broadness and generality of the code can make people feel a little like almost agoraphobic, like that they don't have any good boundaries and handholds. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, well, wait, are you saying that I can use all of these examples every time? Like they want fair use to be harder. And there are situations in which fair use determinations are really hard, but those are the sort of fractal edges of the map where we're trying to figure out sort of where we are in the borderlands. And a lot of the things we're talking about here about using things for critique and illustration 
in an educational context are like the core heartlands of fair use. And so, yeah, if the borders seem really far away, that's because this is really fundamentally uncontroversial. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't take a huge amount of practice and community building and sort of shared, like Carla said, shared discussion and reinforcement and moving forward. But I think one of the reasons this may feel like a big, broad, sort of non-specific enabling thing is because we in fact have been very cautious about something that is in fact, from a legal standpoint, very, very low risk and non-controversial. I'll plus one that, just that part in my discussions with faculty around, with anyone around copyright questions, often I'm trying to sort of like place whatever risk there is in a context, right? Like, oh, look, fair use, uh, it, when you start looking around for it and recognizing it, we are surrounded by it on a daily basis in things that we consume. And once they recognize that, you know, um, and the relative rareness in that context of a lawsuit, you know, that's helpful to them. And I'll sort of plus one that plus one, and maybe this gets us into Amy's question a little bit too, is that we, right, we, we live in this world of reliance on fair use a, a lot of the time, but that's not the only um, 98% that we sort of round up to 100%. We've, we've talked about public domain works and we can talk about whether a work in the public domain is openly licensed or not. Um, but the public domain can get just as arithmetic and confusing and nuanced when you talk about a global context as fair use can. Um, we're generally okay saying, well, this is pretty much in the public domain. And so we're gonna call that openly licensed in some sense. Um, I'd argue that not only is that sort of analogous to the 0.001% the risk a thoughtful fair use analysis does, it's actually riskier in some sense because there's a whole set of protections around good faith belief in fair use in the context of academic non-commercial educational use that aren't there for things like, is this in the public domain? Or like, if I include the golden arches, is there a trademark issue there? No, there's not. And we have an appendix that explains why that and patent and similar issues you shouldn't stay up at night worrying about, but there are lots of things that if you got a law professor and said, find some really interesting nuance here, they could write a good law review article about it, but are not practically meaningful in the calculus when we do, we do when we're creating stuff. And so fair use in a sense is a victim of being a little better understood in that we have shied away from it in the way we haven't shied away from trademark questions or the nuances of public domain in this obscure space or whatever as well. So, so I wanna suggest that we, we live with a certain amount of uncertainty every time we get in our car and drive somewhere, but that doesn't mean we don't drive somewhere. That just means we get our driver's license and we know the rules of the road and we drive thoughtfully and cautiously and safely. I think, I wonder, Will, if that suggests something that might be helpful to the OEN folks in thinking, okay, like if we're thinking about opening adjusting our criteria, how? There's an assumption of uh, like a benefit of the doubt that's extended to authors and creators of works, right? That the things that they believe are in the public domain actually are in the public domain and the things that they believe are openly licensed actually are openly licensed, right? We don't fact check every one of those things. We say like, okay, like you believe these things are either in the public domain or openly licensed and we're gonna like take your, we're assuming that you've been critical in thinking about these things and complying with the licenses. And I think we could extend that also to fair use that an assumption that with a document like the framework in hand, people have been thoughtful and, you know, we can trust their decisions. And in fact, like I would argue, I, I mean, especially in, you know, my own context, like at the University of Kansas, I would strongly, like, I would want to stay really far away from trying to nitpick the decisions that individuals are making about their own intellectual property decisions. Like, they are the ones that are assumed, that are making the decisions. They're ones that are subject to whatever risk may exist around them. Um, you know, like, there's every now and then there's a, a librarian just this is not at KU, but just generally who will sort of be like, well, should that student or person be scanning that book? Like, do they have permission to do that? Or is that, have they thought about the fair use? And I, we just should not be injecting ourselves into those 
um, those things because it's denying that person the right to their own decisions. And I wonder if like the assumption of goodwill that we're extending around public domain and around Creative Commons licensed things, we might also extend around fair use decisions. You're saying my Google image search that turns up images from the Star Wars films aren't actually openly licensed. <laughs> I'm shocked and horrified. My world has exploded. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, to maybe follow up on that question and then answer another one that comes up in the chat about inserting versus linking out. Um, the Creative Commons licenses have never been, at least from a technical sense, a way to avoid engaging with the world of copyright law. The Creative Commons licenses have to function within copyright law, right? And stuff could be labeled as openly licensed that's not, like people do misunderstand them and they label stuff that's not their own or stuff that they're not the owner of. Um, we've all seen that. Uh, I think similarly, uh, determinations about what's in the public domain are determinations that you make within the copyright law system. And in the open textbook library now, there are plenty of materials that rely on fair use to include quotations. And there isn't sort of a difference in the law between fair use that enables quotations and fair use that enables longer excerpts. It's either fair use or it's not. Like you sort of make those decisions. And so I don't think, you know, to the extent that the textbook, the sort of core occupant, the newly authored thing is um, openly licensed. I think it's still appropriate to call those works openly licensed. Um, and those have always been sort of reliant on, you know, all of these other copyright decisions that go into, can I openly license this thing? Uh, oddly in copyright law, there's probably more protection for you if you are wrong about whether something is fair use than if you are wrong about whether or not it was openly licensed. There's a special provision in the law that talks about good faith uh, determinations about fair use. So your protection there is sort of the same um, the other thing I think is it's important to place this sort of in the context of what risks there are if you don't do it. And I think particularly um, when we think about linking out, um, I feel like linking out can often seem like a very, very low risk um, activity. But in fact, I think it, uh, it disproportionately harms the people that we should be most committed to serving when we create OER. Um, I think it, it sort of delegates to random outside sites whether or not materials are accessible for students with disabilities. And it means that students who have uh, low connectivity or who need to be able to download materials and work offline or who need to be otherwise able to manipulate them can't do so. There was a question on one of the discussion lists earlier this week about whether or not, you know, you could caption an indie video. And one of the things I wanted to say is, you know, fair use can let you do that, even if the license does not. And so I think it's important to say, are we willing to tolerate sort of feelings of anxiety about being a little braver about fair use to make sure that we're serving our mission to really provide uh, reliable access to materials to all of our students? Um, there's a question too about non-text inserts like video or sound um, where it's just technologically harder to make clips that are embedded than to link out. Like everyone's very easy with the sort of highlight text, control C, control V process of inserting text. And so I think there is this other thing of becoming comfortable with the technological steps to make and insert clips. And I think that's important and probably should be part of uh, also thinking through whether you're making those accessible. Thank you all. It's great to um, listen to you knock these ideas around together. And, and thank you, Amy and Emily, for questions in the chat. Um, we've explored this a little bit, you know, the, the OTL question and Josh, I, I, I'm not sure how long ago now it was that you uh, submitted the book to the OTL with all of the video clips um, that you know raised this issue for us. Um, and so I think that is sort of a nice case study for you know 
actually, maybe now they think about it, the one time when it has been really like, hmm, how do we approach this in the OTL? Because the rest of the time, it's kind of as all of you have been saying, like, oh, well, this is a part of the practice, and we can assume it's already in open textbooks, and so maybe there's not anything special to call out in the criteria. Um, so that leads me to, you know, I guess putting the question uh, not just to Amy, but to everyone who's here, you know, does that seem a reasonable um, part of our practice that, you know, we we're going we're going to assume that there um, are quotations or excerpts or you know whatever is decided uh, can be used uh, under fair use in open textbooks without necessarily like <laughs> pointing you know red arrows towards it or otherwise you know sounding the bugles that that this is a big change does it just feel like a natural shift or Amy, you know, would you feel like, oh, this is something I need to communicate to faculty when introducing the library to them? I think it's a really great question that I would love to hear from all of you because you're doing this work. Like, you know, um, I don't know if an informal poll is helpful, like on a, um, just because it's a, it's a little bit of a quiet group, um, you know, to, to get a sense of, okay, this is not that big of a deal, we've gotten here together and we're gonna do it versus, I don't know, this is making me feel kind of iffy about the whole um, endeavor. So um, I'm, I am gonna put an informal poll in the chat just so that um, you can just type in a single digit and give us um, a little bit of a clue. So I've worded it as, how do you feel about integrating the code into your faculty consultations? Is that a good wording? Is there anything the panelists would, would prefer? Okay. Um, one, <laughs> this is what happens when you write a code on the fly. Uh, one being, I feel totally comfortable is the key word there, not just totally. Two being, I feel sort of comfortable doing this. And three being like, this, this is complicating uh, OER for me and I'm not really jazzed at the prospect. Uh, if you would kindly just drop in a one, two, or three that best represents where you're at right now, that would be super helpful to us. Woo! <laughs> I'm excited that we got a little ones. I support everyone who is thoughtful and conservative in their approach too. I was just afraid it was gonna all be like fours. Like, why are we here? <laughs> and a gloss we might. I'm happy to see mostly ones and twos as well. A gloss we might add is the question isn't are we done? Do we never have to offer training or have further con conversations about it? The question is, assuming there's an appropriate level of support at the beginning and then an ongoing fashion, would you feel comfortable with that? And also, I think one of the things um, that we're going to say is that we also acknowledge that the group of people on this call is not necessarily the only group of decision makers or stakeholders that um, is involved in the decisions both in individual textbooks or at an institutional level. Um, and so we really hope to have both subject matter specific webinars that come out programs, things other than just webinars at some point in the future, we hope, but um, webinars uh, that come out on subject specific stuff, because I think the way that fair use plays out if you're a mathematician and the way that fair use plays out if you teach political science are really different, even though the law is the same, the examples are really different. Um, we're also on the other end of the spectrum, planning a workshop and possibly a CLE, a continuing legal education course with university council, because I know for many people, um, you know, in small sort of case by case situations, stuff doesn't go to university council, but if you're going to make you know, substantive changes in the way that you give guidance, you wouldn't necessarily run that individual guidance by university council, but you would need their sign off that this, that fair use was gonna be a part of your analysis. That's a great point. We're also uh, hoping to develop some sort of case studies where we'll have a group of people develop a new uh, open educational resource relying on the code and then we'll talk about their process. Here's how we did it. Here's what it looked like in practice in those different spaces as well. And I, I think that on the ground, here's what it actually looks like when I do it stuff will be particularly useful. 
something I'd like to share to kind of build on what Meredith talked about with camp, campus legal counsel, but even the case studies we'll just mentioned is um, know that there's going to be many times if you are going into your campus legal to talk about copyright that you may know more than they do about the law. Um, I was once working with campus legal counsel and he said, you know, Carla, he came from a background um, and when he had worked in private practice that was like home mortgages and things like that. And he said, unless the campus legal counsel has specialized in intellectual property law, he said the most copyright I ever had was four weeks of copyright law and an introduction to IP course when I was in law school 25 years ago. So he said, I really appreciate you bringing all this great information to me that I can use to kind of get a better understanding of where you're coming from and the law because I'm not up to date on all of this. And so um, I think this code is a great way to say, here's fair use, here's a community of practice. Meredith, I love that you're gonna offer this training to legal counsel. And you know, I think things like case studies too can just help kind of inform everybody, whether they're creators or people in our role or campus legal counsel, here's some like boots on the ground scenarios where these have been worked through or thought about within the context of fair use. So um, again, another confidence thing is, is if you are going to have that conversation and with library administrators too, be confident that you may know more about the law than they do and uh, that you have good information in this code to share with them. I'm also excited about the discipline specific case studies. I love case studies. They're so fun. Um, I also love an informal poll in chat. So not to pee harpy on this, but do you think OTL criteria needs to be adjusted to highlight that fair use is okay? Yes or no? One being yes, just call it out or even point people to the code or no, this is um, you know what we're what we're doing. Thank you, Michael and Megan, for those early returns. Panelists also welcome to voice their opinion. All responses welcome. I'm so far, this is a landslide, definitive. <laughs> I'm not individually or sort of institutionally a participator in the OEN. I'm going to hold back on voting for that. But I will say, in the code itself, we lay out uh, a lot of considerations about how you would label when you have relied on fair use. And that's fairly context dependent. It would be sort of odd and unwieldy to label every individual quote with some complicated fair use label, right? You know, you start out your thing with, you know, so-and-so said, blah, 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 this is used under fair use. They also said, blah, 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 also used under fair, like that would be sort of absurd. Um, and at the same time, I think it's very, very important that subsequent users who in the same way they might evaluate your pedagogy or evaluate your underlying expertise could go in and evaluate whether or not they were comfortable with the fair use decisions. And so one of the things that um, OEN could do in their sort of adopting and documentation about relying on fair use is saying, when you relied on the code for anything other than short textural quotations that are obviously marked in the standard format in your discipline, you should include a list of your included materials in the front matter and labeling or whatever. That there are lots of different ways you could do that. And I would encourage it to be flexible, not formalistic, but you could, you know, one of the ways you could build shared understanding would be to say, here for specifically for our community is how we think it's responsible to mark fair use. In the interviews we did in the process, there was a really wide range, a surprisingly wide range of uh, responses about whether or not and how you should mark fair use. And interestingly, without you know telling any secrets or naming any names, the more confident people were about fair use, the less they felt compelled to sort of market in a highly technological way, which was surprising, I think, to me. And is part, I think, of this shared sort of confidence building and like taking, holding hands and sort of taking some gradual steps together forward, which is people, I think, are hesitant to mark fair use because they're hesitant to have to do it 100% out loud to say, yep, 
I am calling your attention to the fact that I relied on fair use. And so, you know, I think doing that in projects where you have partners and collaborators, where you've talked it out with someone about why this is good pedagogy and why it's responsible fair use and building out case studies and projects that give us some examples for that are gonna be really important. Josh, you were nodding. Does that resonate with you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like on the one hand, we label, you know, you you know, I think we get especially with images, right? Like you're you're right about when it, it text, we quote things all the time and we never say under what circumstances we're quoting them it's just sort of there and in most cases that's fair use though there's probably a lot of it that's public domain but mostly people don't do a whole lot of critical thinking about it i think that's just like it's a way that you do scholarship and writing yeah. is to quote things yeah um but uh, but for images you know like we tend to used with permission um this image from here licensed CC by or you know like whatever the case and so it then or they're silent and you're left there's a lot of images that are also silent and you just yeah. are left to sort of guess right you're like maybe they got permission yeah I mean being able to know like for me it feels better to say okay this is an image in the public domain this is one that is licensed under a creative commons license and this one is being used under fair use so that I, as a downstream user, or like if I'm thinking of doing something new, I, I know. Yeah, and I think um, it's really important. Yeah. I might suggest this is an image I believe is in the public domain, but um, being, that being a complicated question, but I think, um, I think that, you know, one of the things about trying to build up confidence as a community is being willing to in small incremental ways, take the risk of doing this work out loud. You know, one of the things about fair use is there are huge, consistent corporate practices that rely 100% on fair use all day, every day, right? Like all of Google, all of the Daily Show, all of these big, real commercial things. A lot of um, the passages in standardized testing are all just taken based on fair use. They didn't like get people to write those random reading comprehension passages. Um, and everybody just does that and it's their practice, but they don't have to like stamp a label on it, right? Like the Daily Show doesn't run a disclaimer at the end of every episode that says, clips in the Daily Show were used pursuant to fair use. I would love that, but uh, they haven't responded to my emails, so they don't. Uh, but that sort of thing I think is gonna be part of building up confidence in the community that other people who are smart, responsible people that you know and respect are doing this too. And I think something that Will and Peter and Prue and I really hope to do is provide through the workshops over the next year or so, the community sort of feedback and technical assistance to help people talk through those decisions and have some sort of support and encouragement in starting to do that. Yeah, I I appreciate that a lot. And, and those examples of like large corporate uses, uh, you know, mundane corporate uses of fair use, right? I think the, the, there's a, a wrinkle that in a academic contexts, there's an expectation of attribution and citation that may not be as relevant in in those other contexts and you know like that's a, a, a difference in um our practices well, well i think that's really important um to separate being really careful and really respectful and perhaps extra cautious about attribution and all of the sort of ethical norms that um, people follow in academic practice and keeping that separate from the copyright norms about what do you have to pay to license? Because, you know, if you live in a crowded downtown neighborhood, you might decide that it's polite to not always park in front of your neighbor's house instead of your own house. And that might be sort of an ethics of getting along with the people you work with and accepting that everybody really wants to get to park in front of their house. But that's different than like paying for the parking meter 
after the time that you need to, you know, paying for the parking meter at midnight, that you sort of want to separate, is this about relationships and ethics? Or is this about the sort of, do I have the legal right to do this in this commercial, in this utilitarian context? Dave made a comment in the chat um, regarding your Daily Show example, Meredith. Um, you know that that it's not sort of mixed in the same way that uh, it is in a textbook. That you you know that there's not typically openly licensed material in a Daily Show episode, and so it might, um, I guess, be less clear. Am I representing that right, Dave? Hi, hi everybody. Hi, friends. Uh, yeah, I think it's just I'm thinking about the user and I in no way am assuming anything about anything I see in the Daily Show that I have any rights to it, right? <laughs> Never crosses my mind. But if it's, a, if it's an open textbook and there are things in there that uh, are, it's a mix of things, that's what we want to avoid, right? We want people to treat open content as open content and fair use material is fair use material. And we, we need them to know that difference. Otherwise they're going to assume it's openly, I don't, that's what I want to avoid as assumptions, I guess. Yeah, I think that's absolutely yeah. right. And I, I think we're, we're deliberate to Josh's point as well about saying in that section, it's about the sort of local community context or the disciplinary context. The appropriate marking or attribution is the attribution that aligns with the, the values of the community of use in different ways. Um, and I, I think if you go into the, the text of a Creative Commons license, it one anticipates some sort of fair use and has an expectation that it will be clearly labeled that this is all openly licensed except for the stuff that's not openly licensed. And I, I think with a, with a very draconian lawyer's hat on, I would say public domain material needed to be labeled as well because that's a different category of things. This is the three legs of the stool that we've talked about in past presentations, openly licensed, public domain, and um, fair use based. But, but to me, the, the touchstone is always clear communication. And David, I think that's what I heard you saying as well, is the context of watching The Daily Show would lead you to go, I probably don't have rights to use that unless I'm told otherwise. The context of an open textbook is, um, well, there is a Creative Commons license at the beginning. So I presume it's openly licensed unless I have other information about it. So how that other information is presented might be very granular for a large image or to Meredith's point about the, you know, everything with bunny ears around the words doesn't need to have a marking beside it. It might be less granular and more. Well, in the discipline of history, you expect when you see quotation marks around something, that's a quotation. It's probably not used with permission. So I presume that's fair use. But the touchstone is clear communication to users. And I mean, just to, you know, complicate it maybe a little bit, um, you know the the OEN slide decks, right? Like, are are they are OER about open textbooks and the problems they address and how CC licenses work and all of these things? And I would think that, like, as things that are reused and adapted go, on the whole, I bet those slide decks are heavily relatively used and adapted like as a as, you know an object that has been put out into the community and then is used by lots of other people who change it and do other things with it embedded throughout it are screen caps that are third party uses that are fairly used and it's just never been a problem right we don't like we don't lose any sleep over that like no one worries about it no one has fear adapting that slideshow to their own context and making their own remix of it, continuing to use those screen caps that they recognize don't belong to them. And probably, I mean, you know, like there's a, if it's a screen cap of a CNN story, like the, I think most people, if they bothered to think about it, would assume that the rights belong to CNN. But again, that like no one got permission, though Ian didn't get permission from CNN to, to use the screen cap. So, like it's a, I wonder if we think somewhat selectively where like there's this one context that we think really critically about it, but this other context where we've been living with it routinely for going on a, maybe a decade or more now, right? And like it's just never been controversial. 
Well, and to build a little bit on what Josh has said, said, just said about what do we, what have we been living with? And I hope I can say this in the right context. Within the score, scope of a normal book, be it a textbook or a scholarly monograph, we generally don't see any call outs, period, unless it's required by a license. Um, so I think the vast majority of things are reused and cited, often under fair use. And like Meredith said, you know, that that's not called out every single time in a scholarly monograph. Now, there might be a picture that might just have citation, just like a quote might have a citation. Sometimes we'll see after that picture, used with permission, and often that's because it's required by the contract when you got permission. Um, but otherwise, in a lot of scholarly monographs, you know, it's usually never ever really called out unless it's reused under some type of open license or some other type of license that maybe we paid for. Um, that requires us to do that, although I've seen plenty of open works you be reused and not be properly attributed. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I guess, you know, kind of the converse here for open educational resources is those openly licensed works would be called out. And the things that are fair use, there would just kind of be the context that those things that are called out are being reused under fair use. I hope that made sense. I have this bubbling in my mind and I feel like I can't get it out correctly. This is such a, the academic hat on now. I love getting into the weeds in terms of this kind of conversation. You can sort of see why we said, several approaches might make sense in an individual community rather than defining one because there, there's so much nuance and context here um, that, that's worth talking about and worth translating into different disciplinary practices. Um, so, so I think that the reason the code said marking in some sense is important, the way it's done should be done thoughtfully and contextually rather than dictating a certain approach. Well, and Will, something that just popped into my mind when you said that is it's the same for open licenses. There is kind of a best format set forward by the Creative Commons and how to cite a open work that's used under Creative Commons license, but you're not required to do that. Um, instead, you're required to include the components thoughtfully. Um, so there's even that flexibility from the Creative Commons for how you are going to provide that. Thank you all for the thoughtful conversation. Are there other questions that uh, we would like to explore in the time we have remaining? We have about 20 minutes left, and this is our time to keep getting into the weeds of fair use and how we might use it in our community or to share case studies. We have a couple people who are able to join us at the top of the hour, and so uh, welcome. This is uh, your time to ask questions and think out loud on uh, the code of best practices for fair use in OER. I'm going to pause to allow unmuting or thinking. While everyone is thinking, maybe it would be useful if Will and I talk through one example of how you might use the code in a specific case. Would that be interesting to people? So, um, Will, I'm going to make you. I can't decide which, which of the hard questions I'm going to make you answer, but get excited. It's going to be a number of them. Um, so one of the things that we've started thinking about, you know, we've done a number of these sort of general webinars about how to think through the code. And in order to make this sort of more concrete for people, we were thinking about how to focus on specific pedagogical goals and think about how the code might enable that. And one that has come up in both the K through 12 and the higher education context is how to create teaching and learning materials that focus on um, current political events and their reception in the media and in sort of coverage of them to talk about um, protest and advocacy and um, news coverage and social media. And so, um, if you were interested in teaching a political communications class, if you were interested in teaching a political science class that talks about um, the evolution of civil rights protests of popular protest, it would be very, very hard to teach that only with 
materials that are either in the public domain or Creative Commons licensed. Because the Creative Commons license didn't exist for most of political protests in the 20th century. They've only existed for 20 years. So you could cover modern protests in, you cover Black Lives Matter protests, you could cover the Capitol riots, but you couldn't cover any of the civil rights movement using openly licensed materials. And at the same time, almost none of those materials are in the public domain yet. So if you wanted to talk about that, you might get some early suffragette protest stuff that was in the public domain, but then there'd be this big sort of donut hole in the middle where that wasn't there. And so Will, um, if I came to you and I was a political science professor, yeah, get on the hot seat. And I said, you know, I really wanna teach this class and I want to use clips from uh, news broadcasts from the, 1950s and 1960s, and I want to talk about how we've really changed the way that we conceptualize the civil rights protests, that they were considered dangerous and radical when they happened and have been sort of revised to be virtuous and widely accepted now. So I want to use clips from 1960s, I want to use clips from the 1980s, and I want to use clips from today, and then I want to use other moderate stuff now. And how much of those can I use? Can I use 10 seconds? Can I use 10 minutes? Like, what's, how do I figure that out? I would have a big smile on my face for several different reasons. <laughs> the, the first sort of high level one is to say that, that you have picked an example that exists at the, at the apex of what fair use is for. That there's clear social value here. This is public and, and it's sort of about, um, public uh, contests and discussions. So if, if, if this were to go before a judge, this is the best possible posture for a fair use discussion to be happening. Um, I would also be smiling a big smile because this is an area that there, have, there are some real documented gaps, right? There, there have, there's been research done on um, what communities are overrepresented in the commons and what communities are underrepresented in the commons. Um, and people, particularly um, disadvantaged communities, engaging in protests are not overrepresented in the commons writ large, right? So if so, in one sense, the question is, do I not get to cover these social movements at all because I'm afraid of copyright, or do I come to grips with fair use in some sense? Um, so it's sort of at the, at the height of the strength of, the, of fair use in that sense as well. Um, the other reason I'd smile a big smile is because the answer to most of those questions is in the code itself. Is it 10 seconds or 10 minutes? Well, that's not really the right question. Here, let me show you this great code of best practices that walks you through how to do that um, in, in other ways to ask those good pedagogy equals good fair use questions. Um, so you, you mentioned some specific examples that rely on illustration, for example. And when we talk about these issues, we often use the idea of an iconic image from a moment in history, such as from the civil rights movement, as exactly the sort of thing that the, the principle around illustration is there to do. But I, um, I, mean, I, I see you grimacing. Go on. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just wondering, should I reach out and try to license them first? <laughs> um, well, there are a few questions around there. A, a lot of the protests um, were not done by large uh, corporations who are in the business of licensing materials. Um, I, one of the first cases I got when I started as a copyright librarian was from the American Communist Society in the 30s. And they didn't exist, or maybe it was North Carolina anyway, they A, didn't exist, and B, didn't believe in private property. So we're unlikely to have a very thoughtful licensing conversation in that space, right? Um, but also, no, because the need is so high, um, there are also examples of very um, defensive, I won't say acquisitive necessary, that there are certainly rights holders who have taken uh, popular materials from recent history who may or may not have any relationship from the people featured in those images and make a pretty good gold mine out of charging huge, huge licenses for those things. So if we add a third option where you, you have to spend $20 million to write your book or to create your, your lesson or whatever, that's not a great option either. Um, so that's another place where fair use is, is existing as it should in places where there isn't a market to be harmed or in cases where there isn't a legitimate market that would be undercut by your use because what you're doing is the sort of transformative use that fair use is designed to support in the first place. And do you think More I should take like screen caps from social media? Like if I want to have like the news, but then like also how people responded to it. <laughs> 
Uh, the answer to that question goes back to the pedagogy question we talked about a moment ago. Um, if you can talk about the pedagogical purposes for, for making those screen caps, absolutely, right? Um, if you wanted to do something systematic through Twitter, there's an API that's going to make it easier to download these things. But if the best way to get access to the appropriate pedagogical materials is through screen caps, um, that's what fair use is for. Thanks. Do you feel better? Are there other questions? No. Okay, great. I would then offer to sit down and, and sort of talk through in more granular levels. But yeah, that's that's a really nice example there. Awesome. I would also say, um, putting on my advice giving hat, not my inquisitive professor hat, that um, you know, there's often questions with stuff like social media that have to do with privacy and sort of um, not even privacy legally, because we have almost no privacy law in the United States, but privacy ethically or sort of community ownership or whatever that may come into reposting social media, particularly social media from <laughs> seeking out um, permission may be really important, but it's separate from sort of the copyright question of whether those things are available under fair use. That's a great point. And that, sorry, there's a B in here. So if that's why my, my microphone is buzzing, that's what that strange buzzing sound is. Um, the people you want to talk to are sometimes really different people in that context. The people who have an ethical um, sort of, you know, a, a, a claim on that space are not necessarily the rights holders in that context. So you want to talk to the communities that, re that are represented in that space. Like there's this whole ethical conversation that I hope our hypothetical faculty member is already thoughtful about and familiar with, um, but really emphasizing that just because the Disney Corporation owns the rights to this thing doesn't mean your ethical obligation is to the Walt Disney Corporation. It's instead to the, the human beings who were involved in this work in a more direct way. But that's a really, really good point for sure. Meredith, you mentioned uh, a suite of scenarios. I wasn't sure if you were going to segue into another character or role. Um, I could. Uh, I wanted to give it some time for some real questions that that might have brought up. Um, I didn't want to. I don't want to take up all of the space. Um, also, Will might need to do something else, like fight off the, in the hornets. <laughs> but it's I just a... You know, one of the things that we really hope for the code is that it would enable projects that had otherwise gotten sort of to a roadblock. So I'd be really interested um, without necessarily having to have any definitive answers, but whether anyone on the call had ever been working with a professor or a feline on a project that had gotten stalled because of copyright uncertainty and whether they'd be interested in uh, talking about that. Uh, there was also a question that I don't know that we addressed that was preloaded into the document about, um, you know, one of the things we talk about in the code itself is about what's protectable and what's not. And we say that, you know, generally the structure of educational resources broadly is not protectable, right? The idea that you teach biology by starting with evolution and then talking about the cell and then talking about organelles and then talking about whatever, that this is the sort of standard or often in situations there's like two or three different progressions through something that is sort of often followed in, um, in introductory and advanced courses. And people have asked about that um, in the context of, a, of litigation between Boundless, a educational publisher that made open resources that were very directly keyed to proprietary books with a sort of direct advertising of substitution. And I would just say that um, that case probably doesn't teach us very much about sitting down and creating new OER because it's a pretty narrow situation of not just trying to create a book that does the same thing as those books, but a book that can be used as a direct substitute alongside it in the same classes. Um, is really a different thing from a fair use standpoint um, than just saying I want to teach the same subject in broadly the same approach. Um, and then even there, we actually never got a decision in that case. Boundless chose to settle. 
but I don't think it's clear how a court would have decided. And maybe how a court would have decided after the recent uh, Google versus Oracle case, which has been an incredibly yeah. ringing endorsement of fair use in, in some new ways as well. Do you want to I say something want... about that, Will, about the Google case? Oh, um, I, I could say a lot about that, but I won't uh, subject you to that here in the later part of the afternoon. But but quickly, this was a case that had to do, um, Google had repurposed um, these APIs from Oracle. Oracle sued because they're Oracle. Um, and the court uh, dodged the protectability question that I think a lot of scholars thought was maybe the right way to answer it and jumped uh, with both feet into fair use, basically arguing um, in as expansive a way as I've seen that, that fair use protects this uh, to an extremely high level and that one of the factors to be considered was not just was there market harm but was society being served in some way and that was sort of new language saying that part of the calculus isn't just is, is that poor rights holder getting messed up or not but actually if there is societal clear societal value here that's a that's a plus factor that strengthens i asked my law professor back in the day that question and they said no courts don't really consider that so the Supreme Court says they do now, so that's that's all for the good for OER makers in write general. A follow up note. <laughs> well, uh, Lolly's retired; she doesn't care about any but, of this stuff. Yeah, there it is really a, this huge expansion of not just saying. I mean, there was at some level clear, if not the type of market harm that was cognizable under fair use, there was a clear impact on you know Google's ability to do this for free hugely impacted how much money Oracle could make them pay to do it, right? Like this is a clear commercial competition. And they said, this isn't the type of market harm we recognize. And it really added in this idea almost of whether it was undue market harm, like whether it was, if it was harm because you were doing this societal benefit that we think should be free. Um, you know, I think it's a hugely powerful case. And I agree with you that it would be a lot easier to argue boundless today than a year ago. In fact, it might be very hard to, it might be harder for the people who sued them to even state their case. Yep, totally agree, absolutely. And and, and uh, just to say out loud, to, so that it's said out loud, the reason courts have, have ruled that way that, that the, the fact that you have asked for a license isn't cognizable market harm is because the circularity of that would mean that there wasn't fair use anymore. If any time I stuck my hand out, fair use magically disappeared, there would never be fair use, right? Um, I, I see we only have a few minutes left. I see David has an example as well. Um, so that I have one more question I wanna ask, but let's get to David's question first. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm responding to Meredith's call for examples of projects that have stopped because of concerns about copyright, I guess. This is an old one, this is from 15 years ago. And Meredith, I probably already told you this example when we've talked about fair use in the past. Um, I tried to convince a faculty member um, and she was the uh, chair of my doctoral committee. So I wasn't gonna argue with her um, about it, just that she should use fair use. I was helping her put her online course together and that she should use, she should make the analysis and, um, and consider fair use. And she basically said to me, I make my living in, with intellectual property. She's a, she's a vice president now. She's a very accomplished researcher, NSF grants. She's usually got about three at a time, very accomplished academic. She said, I make my living publishing in, in, with intellectual property. If I get in trouble, I'm done. Like if I, so it, it was this matter of certainty, right? That I think a lot of people struggle with with fair use. It, it doesn't seem certain enough like you can't just give me a badge. It says, yep, this is good. Um, so that she never did it. And uh, you know, that, sorry, go ahead. no, I was just saying that's a, it's a really, it's a really interesting question because I think a lot of people feel like relying on fair use is somehow being disrespectful to the legal principles of copyright law. And I think that that's understandable, but I also think at some level that it is wrong, um, that the principles of copyright law are really oriented towards public benefit, not towards author, sort of indefinite author support. Like we, we like supporting authors because it means they're gonna write new valuable stuff, but our whole system is meant to get 
information and knowledge out there where people can use it. And fair use is part of what lets people use that knowledge. It's actually one of the sort of core ways we think about US copyright law. Separate a little bit differently from um, some systems like for example, France, which have a really strong moral rights doctrine. Yeah. They have other limitations and exceptions, but it's one of the reasons they don't have fair use. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would just have to say from her perspective, she was making a risk analysis. Yeah. She was saying it's not worth the risk to me. So anyway, I just think that's an interesting perspective that, that where I was trying to keep in mind, I think it's just, if we want people to do this, yeah. it can't just be a legal analysis. It needs to be analysis of the user's motivations and kind of what they're thinking about. But and I think that's one reason to maybe go a little bit above and beyond an attribution to be super right. clear. This is this really valuable, amazing point from this person. It's best emphasized in this clip. To give, to make sure that you are, as a, that extra attribution is a way to mitigate that risk that you're trying to get away with, that people will feel like you're trying to get away with something. And I don't think we'd argue for mandating fair use reliance either, right? If you don't want to use fair use, you always have the option not to do it. I also want, before the bee comes back, quickly to say this, there's a perfect analogy to the documentary filmmakers who were sort of the start for the whole codes of best practice thing. They said specifically, we can't get errors in emissions insurance because if we're wrong, we're sunk. And the, the code responded by saying, here's something you can show to those insurers to say, this isn't a guess. This isn't a eh, fair use, baby. Here's my get out of jail free card. And it was it was successful. So something you could have said to her had there been a code of best practice is, well, you know, other communities have gone from that feels too risky to this feels grounded in something in a concrete way. Um, so so maybe that would have been a good answer had we had the code at that point. And I would say that in those insurance cases, sometimes you're actually getting a fair use opinion letter, which means going to a lawyer in private practice. Um, and they're not usually, it's not a huge long engagement, it's relatively short, and you actually get an opinion letter from that uh, practitioner who says, it is my legal opinion, this is fair use, you've complied with the code, and that allows people to get this errors and omissions insurance for film distribution, and it's possible that at some level of formality, if you had a particularly complicated and in-depth fair use question for an OER, for a big like textbook replacement OER, that you might consider whether or not you wanted to get an opinion letter that said, yeah, absolutely, you followed the code, this is core fair use. It's not the same as that insurance case, but it might give people a little extra belt and suspenders reassurance for really big projects. Sometimes we all need belts and suspenders. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, and I know Jonathan uh, has his uh, hand up. So, Jonathan, I think you can unmute. Yeah, thanks. So, okay. I, so if I'm just understanding, it seemed like when Meredith was asking um, Will that hot seat question about can you use those clips and things from modern events, that it was that his answer, if I translate from the cautious lawyer speak, was like go for it, right? That all of those things, those those were current. You know, they were being those clips and those photographs from the front page of the New York Times or whatever. Those were being the use was reported in current events. You're talking about using these to analyze social movements, talk about history, talk about politics. I think we use the phrase political science, Meredith, and that's enough of a transformation of use. Just go to town on it. Um, is so is that so? Like for example, I taught when I teach statistics, I always I, every time I open the newspaper, I say this graph has to be in my class today because it's just it's like it's about statistics, it's about applied statistics. And I wrote an OER on statistics, and I was super careful. I like had only one live image from some current event, which I actually bound the data set and remade the image myself. And you know, so is is the is the is the message that you guys are telling me that I should have just gone a whole hog and had all, because those were in the newspaper because they were telling a story about, you know, oh, you know, COVID, there's this thing about uh, voting for Trump means you're more likely to get COVID or whatever. And I should put that in, I can just take that image and put it in my textbook because they have a current event story and I have a pedagogical purpose in statistics and just go to town voting. Is that is that a summary of what you were saying, what you would say to me? I would say that that is, right in one really important way and wrong in one really important way. How about that? Um, I think that most of those uses are probably fair use, especially if in the text you had a reason that these were specifically important, like that the statistical analysis here shows that actually 
we have a very low p-value and we have like almost no certainty that they're reporting this as being information, but actually we see that it's almost all noise. Or alternatively, they're reporting this as being uncertain, but the statistics show that it is really certain. If you're digging in with that specific example, that you have a pedagogical engagement with that image, yes, that's a very sort of classic fair use. What I would say is that the fact that it is fair use for someone to use something for one pedagogical purpose, like talking about the evolution of the coverage of uh, protest in the United States, may or may not mean that using that same snipped out object is fair use for a different pedagogical purpose. So I think your example is very likely to be fair use, but there are plenty of examples where using five minutes of a movie or 10 minutes of a movie or even half an hour of a movie can be fair use for one purpose within teaching, but could be not fair use for a different purpose if you weren't engaging with the material for the same pedagogical purpose. Will, do you wanna to add to that? In the chat, I was just adding that, that each of the principles has that set of considerations and hard cases that goes along with it. So that often points to things like use a variety of different sources where appropriate, not just one source over and over, right? The, the, that's some of the pushback against the, so I just go to town idea that, that I might've been saying in, a, in sort of a flip way up here, but, but each of the principles has a, don't forget this, be thoughtful about this. And if you move over here, look especially closely at this. So I, I think um, that making sure for, for Meredith and I and others that when we present the code, we present them in the context of those considerations and hard cases is gonna be an important thing for me to keep in mind. And I would, I would just say that um, ironically, the, the second big category of things that we think fair use permits is for the purposes of illustration. And confusingly, that means for almost every purpose except the sort of lay way that we mean illustration as decoration. So using it to illustrate a point, like often you could have statistical significance without clinical significance. So here we see a statistically significant result, but if you read the discussion in the paper, that doesn't actually change what patients should decide. That's an illustration of that idea. You could pick from a lot of different choices, but this one is a good one to pick. If instead you wanted to put graphs in the front matter of your book because they're pretty and they look like graphs, a sort of decorative purpose, that's a real weak argument. And ironically, the word illustration in sort of the lay sense encompasses both, but we really mean illustrating a point or an idea or a technique, not you need more pictures on your slides, come on, I know you're lawyers, but for real type of illustrations. <laughs> on that self-deprecating note, uh, there's a question uh, about using a graph from an equipment user manual, a textbook. That's a great example. I think very many of those are fair use. We talk about it explicitly in the code and we will talk about it more next time we see you. What a great cliffhanger. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining. We did indeed spend 90 minutes together talking about the code and talking about fair use. So thank you for your questions. Thanks to all of our guests, Josh, who um, already needed to drop off, Carla, Meredith, and Will. It's always a pleasure listening in on your conversations. Thank you so much for your time and look forward to seeing um, as many of you who can make it back on May 12th when we continue this conversation. Thanks again.